Welcome to this Hey Legal Exclusive. Hey Legal Exclusive. Content that will keep you up to date and informed about the important legal issues of the day. Time is of the essence, so let's begin. So I'm joined by Brian McConaughey QC, who has uh, just completed the first um, jury trial in Glasgow since lockdown. Hello, Brian. Hi. So, Brian, um, we know we, we've heard from Ian McSporing QC, who told us about his trial in Edinburgh, which followed a model whereby the jurors were never within the courtroom itself. They were all um, completely separate in a, in a different room um, entirely, a different courtroom entirely in Edinburgh. Um, could you tell us a bit about the Glasgow trial and, and the setup there? Yeah, the, the, the setup in Glasgow was that the trial took place in Court 4, which is obviously you'll know, but others might not. It's one of the, the big courts down on the, the ground floor. Mm -hmm. um, and it has a large public gallery, as do all of these courts. And that was where the actual trial took place. The jury room, so normally that would just be effectively through the back of the court and it's a relatively small room in which the jury would uh, come in in the morning and would go away for their deliberations and have their lunch and so on. The, the jury room was actually court five. Right. So they were using two courts for the jury. They, the, the initial talk was there was going to be a third court for members of the public mm -hmm. and or members of the press. Um, but in fact, as I understand it, what they used was the jury muster room where the unimpaneled jurors used to mix yeah. uh, up the stairs. But I honestly don't know whether anybody used that room. I, I was told on day one that if there were any family members who were going to attend in relation to the accused, that the clerk of court had to know because I presume they were going to set that room out socially distanced as well. Mm -hmm. But I didn't actually visit that room to see what the setup was. Okay. So in terms then of the trial and et cetera, um, just starting at the beginning, the, the balloting, yeah. of the, how, how did that, how was that conducted well, in your trial? Well, I, th I think it all happens, well, in some respects, the story happens before that, in mm -hmm. that the trial that I did was actually at the moment, I think, down to be a continued preliminary hearing sometime in August. Okay. And the only reason I found out that it was going to be one of the trials in the original batch was because my instructing solicitor had asked the clerk, not the, the clerk of that particular court, but the managing clerk, to send her just a, a business list for the next week or the next few weeks. Okay. And this particular case was on that list, and she phoned me to tell me. Listed as, that, as a trial? As a trial, yeah. Yes. And it, now, there, there might be an explanation for that, although I'm not entirely sure, in that, I came into the case quite late because they only got sanctioned for senior counsel quite late. So I wouldn't have been on the minutes from the preliminary hearing because I didn't do the preliminary hearing. Um, but on the other hand, she didn't know about it until she asked. Yeah. Uh, and so we, we found out it was due to call and I then made inquiries to find out who was dealing with the case. I got hold of the advocate deputy. He then made inquiries and he was told we were down sighted for week two. Right. Which is the week we're about to start, i.e. Yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. Um, it then transpired, and again, I think I found this out by, uh, well, not quite by mistake, but certainly by uh, seeking out the information that we were now the backup trial to what was the first trial, and that the first trial, the accused had a warrant out for him they didn't anticipate he was necessarily going to attend. Right. So they had cited, <coughs> or, or rather they were bringing in our trial on Tuesday, mm -hmm. uh, Monday being a holiday in Glasgow last week. So, okay. uh, so we came in on Tuesday. They didn't have 
the accused from the other trial. So it was then us, we were up and running. All right. And from that, sorry, Brian, from that, I presume then up until that point, that obviously that first you heard about your particular trial, had you seen how this model was going to work ahead of time? No. No. Um, I had I'd gone into the court, I think, on the morning of Tuesday. Mm-hmm. In fact, I went into the, I used to went into court five because I thought for some reason that that's where the trial was, okay. and I was told no, it was in court four. So I, I saw the setup then, right? But that was the first time I'd seen anything to do with it. Okay. Uh, Tony Lenehan had done the mock trial and had issued a, a very helpful note in relation to it. Yeah. Um, so I, I kind of had the the basics of how it was going to work, but. Yeah. Yeah, that was it. I hadn't been present at the mock trial. Oh, all right. So moving on then to the, the actual trial itself, the Tuesday morning, you arrive at court and what happens? Yeah, well, we, we were actually we weren't due to be called in until the Tuesday afternoon. So all it was right. tu- Tuesday at two, the case called, uh, a plea was tendered and, and then they picked the jury. Mm-hmm. Now, the, the way the jury was selected, I, I suspect it was the same as in the Edinburgh model, which was that the jurors had been contacted that day right. to be told they were in the ballot. Mm-hmm. And uh, as I understand it, the method was they were simply telephoned. Those who answered went into the ballot. Those who didn't answer didn't go into the ballot. Yeah. Um, I have no idea how many we were starting from, uh, but I was told there was a sufficiency. I, I don't think, I didn't inquire how many there were, but there was enough. Mm-hmm. Um, and so far as the balloting was concerned, it was, of course, it was A, very simple, and B, very quick, because it was names out of a hat, and there was nobody there. Yeah. So you, you got the first 15 out of the hat, followed by five substitutes. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, what they decided, I think, I presume this is in the legislation somewhere, I don't know, uh, but what they decided was that of the five substitutes, they were, if, if you like, in order. So when the 15 turned up the next day, if somebody said, I can't sit, then you were getting substitute number one, and then two, then three, then four, then five. Okay. So they weren't going to be balloted again. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was us on the uh, on the Tuesday, that was us sent away till Wednesday morning. So the actual, so just to be clear, the <coughs> calls to the jury, potential jurors were in the morning at two o'clock. You came in, the balloting t- took place, and then no evidence the first day. Um, that was, yeah, it was there was nobody there. Okay, I, and Ian spoke about um, I think at that time um, when the jury first came in. Um, I, I understand the jury were given documentation at that time, um, directions that were, were later read out to them by the judge. Did you um, notice anything of that type in your, your trial? If, if that was done, nobody told me. Um, I, I, on, I just simply don't know whether it was done or whether it wasn't done. My impression from listening to the judge's opening remarks was that they didn't have anything in front of them because of, I would have thought he might have mentioned that if, if that were so. But certainly nobody told me if that was the case. Okay. Um, but I, I, I simply don't know. All right. Um, so, 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 when- so on, the, on the Wednesday, uh, everybody turned up, all 20 of the people who had been selected, okay. who had, of course, had to have been telephoned after the selection process in order to tell them to be at court the next day. Yeah. They all, they all turned up. We didn't have a problem. And so the substitutes were simply thanked for their attendance and uh, allowed to go. Mm-hmm. The, the, the way the, uh, I, again, part of this takes place, as it were, out with my presence, so I'm not entirely sure what the story was. But I think on the Wednesday morning, I think they were told to come for 9.30, and then the clerk did the chat to the jury that she would normally do to uh, advise them of the nature of the case and so on and so forth. Um, And then we were called. When the jury came in on the Wednesday morning, it was the 15 
selected balloted jurors who came into the court. Mm -hmm. The five substitutes were up the stairs in the jury muster room. Okay. And after the jury were sworn in, as was usual, they were then given a 10-minute break to consider whether or not there was any reason why they could not serve on the jury. And uh, they then came back. There was no problems. And so Lord Mulholland thanked the five substitutes who were virtual in the sense of they were up the stairs. Mm. And uh, they were then allowed to leave. And uh, then we started. Okay. Um, it, on, on day one, well, prior to day one, prior to the day of the impaneling, the deputy had suggested to me that we would just do a joint minute on that day. Mm -hmm. And I pointed out I didn't think we would have any jurors there, so that wouldn't actually be possible. No. And that, of course, turned out to be the way it was. Um, so once the jury were selected and sworn in and said there was no issues, it, the judge then addressed his preliminary remarks to them. And again, we're, we're all familiar with the situation whereby the jury are given a, a kind of very brief rundown of uh, how the procedure works, mm -hmm. court timings, all that sort of stuff. On this occasion, he spent probably the first 10 minutes, or maybe it wasn't as long as that, but it seemed about 10 minutes, explaining to them in quite uh, a detailed way all of the steps that had been taken to ensure their safety during the trial. Okay. In terms of the court being deep cleaned, what was going to happen with the witnesses, the Mesa was masked during the course of the proceedings uh, in court. I think he's, I'm pretty sure he said there were masks available for them if they wanted them. Right. Uh, I don't think anybody took him up on that offer. Uh, and he explained that they could bring in uh, flasks of coffee for themselves for the breaks mm -hmm. uh, because they wouldn't be getting any right. coffee. Uh, the lunches would be provided, but mm -hmm. would be some kind of vacuum-packed sandwich, I think, uh, was what was on offer. Exactly. And that seemed, that, that seemed to turn into a problem at one point. There was okay. an issue with the jury lunches uh, I suspect that they were not particularly good yeah. and there wasn't any sort of choice. Uh, they weren't being delivered on time, but I suppose the kind of teething problems you might yeah. you might expect. Um, but but he, I, I thought he uh, kind of, g given what he was dealing with was a sort of, you know, this is a terribly strange situation and mm. on, on the face of it, uh, you know, there's potential health implications and so on. I, I thought he dealt with it really well in the sense of providing the information. I thought very much putting them at ease mm -hmm. in the sort of strange circumstances in which w w we were present. Mm -hmm. um, when you, you mentioned there, Brian, about the Maser wore a mask throughout proceedings. Is that right? Yeah. Did yeah. anybody else or was anyone else encouraged to? Uh, certainly, nobody else did. No. Um, as I say, I, the reason I'm sure, he, I'm sure he said, "Sorry, I'm sure he said they were available for the jury, but yeah. I don't think Andy took him up on it." Uh, and, and the reason being, the Mesa was maybe moving around the courtroom more than some anyone else, or yeah, I suspect. And also, he was uh, at times, uh, you know, he he handed things out to the jury. He, I think he handed out the, the indictment, for example. Okay. And so he was in amongst the jury, sure. um, uh, and, we and he was also touching the labelled productions and things. So he was masked and gloved um, right. in, and just, in relation. Sorry, Brian, keep talking over the top. Right. Just in relation to the handing out of things, the touching of labels, I, I presume that the same rule that we heard about from Edinburgh, the 72-hour rule of um, kind of quarantining anything applied in Glasgow as well, is that right? Yeah, I, I, well, I, again, it was raised, it was mentioned. How they got around that, I'm not entirely sure. Okay. Um, 
I, I, I mean, I, I didn't inquire, but um, at the start of the trial, as is the norm, the jury were all given a copy of the indictment. Now, so the indictment had been amended on the Tuesday morning, very, very slightly, but it had been amended. So there had to be a fresh copy made for the jury. Now, that I presume was simply emailed to the clerk. Um, all I can imagine happened is that when that was printed, mm -hmm. that the Mesa presumably took control of that since he was the one who had the gloves and he was the one who had the mask. Okay. And it was then handed out because it certainly didn't, it couldn't lie for 72 hours. No. Um, I think Ian had mentioned that joint minutes and the like, because you would think, again, a joint minute, which is something that's kind of prepared during the course of a trial. Again, I think if, as long as it, the paper had been in a printer and then was... Um, yeah, I, I, after, that must be the way around it. I, I again assume that because there was a joint minute in this case. It was the first yeah. thing they were given after the indictment. Okay. So I, again, I assume uh, it was done in exactly the same way, electronically sent and then handled only by the Mesa. Okay. Um, but to be fair, I don't know that for sure. But right. certainly the issue about them getting anything and the virus arguably living on paper for 72 hours mm. was re was mentioned by the, the clerk at one stage during the proceedings, before we, we really got started. Okay. Um, and, and one of the things that that meant, of course, was that, you know, sometimes in a case you will pass something amongst the jury, yeah. an item, yeah. uh, you know, a, a gun or a knife or whatever mm -hmm. the case may be. Uh, and so that wasn't possible in the case. And it was a case where you might have done that. Right. Um, and what was done instead was that the labelled items were put on the document imager. Okay. And the, uh, there were large screens throughout the public gallery that the jury could see mm -hmm. in order to look at the items on the, the imager. But, for example, you, you, know, you couldn't tell from the imager particularly whether uh, an, item, you know, uh, uh, an item was sharp or not, whether right. it had a blunt edge, whether it was a sharp edge. And so you had to be careful to make sure that you got somebody to speak to something like that yeah. um, so, so that the jury knew that was the evidence about it. So a lot of forward planning, really, if you're dealing with something that's... <laughs> Yeah, I, and I, I suppose the thing is, you don't always know no. what's going to be. I mean, I, I mean, in this particular case, the item that the complainer identified as being an item with which he was robbed mm -hmm. was not what I expected him to identify. Okay. So, you know, it, it wasn't something that you could plan for. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so you had to kind of try and find a way of uh, resolving that, I suppose. Yeah. Um, because you know, they, they can't see things in the same way. No. Um, and so, Brian, dealing with the logistics of the courtroom then, how, how did it differ to a normal court? Where did people sit and the lights? Well, as far as the well of the court was concerned, it was fine. I mean, court, court four was quite a big court. Yeah. Uh, there was only myself and the instructing agent. I didn't have a junior. Okay. Uh, there was the advocate deputy and his assistant and the clerk. And so we, we, were, we were all, broadly speaking, sitting where we would normally be. Yeah. The only thing is, of course, you're not sitting right beside either your instructing agent or your junior. Yeah. And, but, and I think even if you wanted to, the court wouldn't let you. Okay. Um, uh, and so what that means is your sort of sotto voce discussions are not possible. Yeah. Um, and apparently the microphones are very, very sensitive. Okay. So if you are speaking at a level to make sure that your agent or your junior or whatever can hear you, there seems to be, as I understand it, a good chance that the jury can hear you as well. Right. Um, and that's not always what you want for one reason or another. Definitely. So you, you, you've got to be careful about that sort of thing. Uh-huh. Um, the, the other thing that arose on day one was that the judge noticed that the uh, accused was trying to attract attention or was attracting attention. And so the, 
the solicitor who was sitting in with me went across to speak to him mm. and did speak to him very briefly, but did speak to him, came away. And at that point, Lord Mulholland said, you know, we've got to be careful here with regards to social distancing. And so, you know, if, if your client requires to speak to you, tell me and we'll have an adjournment okay. in order that you can do that. Mm. Now, I can understand that on some level that's maybe appropriate, although but my understanding is, in as much as anybody has an understanding of what the rules are, is that you, if, if you're less than two metres from somebody for 15 minutes is when the sort of potential problem arises. Right. I don't think a, a conversation of the kind of duration we were talking about would be an issue, but mm. you know, I, I understand that the judge is trying to look after everybody, so I'm not in any sense criticising him. Mm -hmm. But you can imagine cases where you have a anxious, agitated, needy client yeah. who's you know shouting about something rightly or wrongly every fifteen minutes. Yeah, and if you're going to have to have an adjournment every time in order to go and find out what it's about, that, that would certainly prolong proceedings. Absolutely. Uh, and when we get into doing multiple accused cases, then even more so potentially. Yeah. Um, so uh, as it happens, it didn't become an issue. We had that one you know, discussion at that point, yeah. and then it didn't happen again. And mm -hmm. I okay. certainly, I spoke, I, I spoke to the client at the either at lunchtime or at the end of the day, I can't remember when, and said, look, you know, we can see you first thing in the morning. We can see you at the break around about 11.30. We can see you at one o'clock or thereabouts. And we can see you at four o'clock. Mm -hmm. So anything you have should really be able to be dealt with you know, during yeah. those periods. And it's only if there's something which is absolutely crucial that we've never discussed before that we should be seeking to have a uh, an adjournment to discuss it yeah. because uh, any jury even if it was in normal times would fairly quickly get peeved up. <laughs> if they were in and out of court all the time yeah um, and i think even more so in the current circumstances yeah i think ian, ian had a similar in, uh, incident where there was a huge uh, the same thing i think he'd gone to approach the accused and then um the, the judge said no no we'll have to have an adjournment but Ian felt, given all the promises given to the jury um, in document form and by the sounds of it, um, by Lord Mulholland to your jury uh, verbally, that um, everyone, you know, they were, they were promised that there would be social distancing. So I can see why that would be adhered to. But equally, as you're saying, it's, it could raise just small problems that, that um, perhaps just, as you say, uh, advising accused people of how we might deal with it, unless it's a, a significant issue, um, break yeah. to accommodate in a situation. I, I think it's, you know, it, I suppose like everything else, it's, it's kind of forward planning, if you like, yeah. that, you know, we, we, we have to make sure that the accused is aware of that situation yeah. in order that, that they know they'll get their opportunity to speak to you when the time comes. Um, so in terms of, uh, the, so the well of the court is for all uh, intents and purposes much the same, same personnel in there. Yeah. Where, where then are the jury if, if they're not in the well of the court? The, the jury in my case, and I think in this model, are in the public gallery. Okay. Now, I, I don't know how many people that court seats, but it'll be quite a few. Mm. And, and and they are scattered around it, literally from one end to another, and diagonally. So it it was in I think five. The the way it's split up, it's effectively in five columns of three. Right. You you've got if you if you're looking from the well of the court into the public gallery, you have a juror sitting bottom left. You have a juror sitting bottom right. You have a juror top right, a juror top left, mm -hmm. and everybody else socially distanced in between that square, if you like. Right. Uh, and you know, it, it looks certainly looks clearly socially distanced. You know, it looks very much as if it's been 
marked out. They've got numbers on the seats and everything for the jurors. So, uh, so and, and they bring them in, or certainly at the start, they seem to bring them in in batches. Right. Maybe in five at a time or something like that. Uh-huh. Although I, I, I don't know if it did or did not, but it, it, that seemed to change a little bit as we went along. I, I thought the jury were just kind of getting up and going or coming in, whatever. Okay. Uh, more as a group rather than uh, in batches. But, you know, it, it seemed pretty clear that they were socially distanced, yeah. um, yeah. both during the time they were in the court and when they were away. Mm-hmm. I, and I assume it was the same setup in Court 5. Right. Although it being the jury room, I was never in Court 5 when they were there. But uh, I assume it was a similar sort of setup. Mm-hmm. Although they may have, some of them may have been in the well of the court. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, but certainly, but no again, ability to well, not not that jurors can communicate with each other ordinarily anyway. But I suppose a jury, and very often they're told by lawyers, you know, you are a one body. Your you know your your job is to to come to one or be the mind of the jury. Um, but I guess that's not. There's no kind of camaraderie or camaraderie amongst the jurors in the sense that they're so distant within the, the courtroom? Um, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, it, th- this was a very short trial. I mean, it, mm. effectively, the, the evidence uh, only lasted about a day and a half. Okay. Um, and the, the whole trial, once we got the jury involved, only lasted three days. Mm. So, you know, it, it wasn't the kind of case in which you you would have necessarily you know sometimes you you hear the jury coming in and you hear about laughter yeah, and so on yeah. it's obvious that they've kind of bonded uh-huh. as a as a jury but i suspect you know that, that there wasn't enough time for that to happen yeah. in this case um whether them being seated further apart in the court creates a problem there or not i'm not sure yeah it, it, it might do okay but it, it might also be a benefit i mean you can you can see that in a fifteen a fifteen man jury box, that you might find people who don't like the person they're sitting beside <laughs> or the person they're sitting behind or whatever the case may be. Could be a um, blessing, and can hear too much of what's going on. So, yeah, absolutely, uh, I, I suppose it has its advantages and disadvantages that way. And so, when so moving on to to deal with the actual evidence and witnesses coming into court, is that different, Brian, or what changes are made there? It. In our case, the, there was no obvious difference. Uh, the witnesses were in co- every witness gave evidence from the actual witness box in court, just as per normal. The jury, because of the setup of the court, some jurors would have a, a view in any event of the witness. Uh-huh. But in order to ensure, I think, that, well, to ensure two things, I think. Firstly, that everybody has a view of the witness and also they have a view of the accused because, mm-hmm. of course, they're sitting behind the accused yeah. in, in, the, in the public gallery. So there are two very big tele screens basically set up at the, in the well of the court facing towards the public gallery, which have a split screen, mm-hmm. one half showing the witness, one half showing the dock. Um, and that's that, that's the position all through the trial. Okay. And so, and, and that's slightly different mm-hmm. and potentially a, a little bit problematic for the accused. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, normally, well, certainly, I'm sure everybody has their own way of doing these things. But normally, I would say to a client that you know, kind of just be aware of the fact that during the course of the trial, there are 15 jurors. If your name gets mentioned or whatever. Mm-hmm. There's a reasonable chance one of them at least will be looking at you. So yeah. make sure that you're not, you know, tutting or shaking your head or whatever else you might uh, naturally do. And in this instance, on this model, certainly, potentially all 15 of them are looking at you. Yeah, all the time. You're on the screen at the same time. It's very much as we are at the moment. Yeah. You know, yeah. they, they might be they might be listening to you, but whether they want to or not, they're looking at me. Mm-hmm. Um, and how close up? How close is the camera to the accused face? Cl- close enough. As yeah. probably again, is you know, similar to the view that people would have of us just now. I think. Okay. Um, so, 
you know, that, that, that's something perhaps now, I mean, I, I don't think I really appreciated it until I saw it. Mm. And actually, when I say saw it, the trial had started and so on. Um, I think in the future, I would certainly be making sure the client was well aware of the fact that that is happening because he or she probably can't immediately see that. Right. Um, I, 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 in fact, that's an interesting thought. I, I'm not sure if he has the same view as them. I don't know if he's got a screen in front of him, but probably not. Why would he? No. He can see the witness. So, yeah. um, so I, I, I suspect he doesn't know that. And unusually for a for an accused, he can't see the jury. Well, that's true, yeah, because they're all behind. He, he, he doesn't see them at all. Yeah, he never sees them unless he maybe look glances at them as they're going out. But, mm -hmm. uh, but he doesn't have a view of them throughout the trial. Yeah. Um. So that that that's a little bit a little, a little bit different. Yeah, um, absolutely. And so when it comes to speeches, Brian, what, what happens then? I mean, if they're all spread throughout the public benches, where are you to deliver your speech? Yeah, I, I think th this was the strangest bit, certainly for me, yeah. um, is the, where you would normally question a witness from. Mm -hmm. So the opposite side of the court from the witness box. The uh, lectern is there. Right. And... I think in the in the mock trial, the I don't know about Tony Lenehan, but the deputy I'm told addressed the jury from the public gallery side of the dock. Right. But neither myself nor the advocate deputy thought that was a good thing. Okay. Um, so we both addressed the jury pretty much from where we would be quite well were questioning the witnesses just speaking out into the public gallery. Mm -hmm. um, and it was it, it was a wee bit different for me because yeah. I, I quite like to move about when I'm speaking. Okay. And that wasn't really possible. Uh, so, so you're kind of looking you know, over the, the dividing wall, essentially, from the public benches to the well of yeah. the court. You're hanging over that, I suppose, a bit yeah. like a over a dike. <laughs> yeah, a wee bit, a wee bit like that. Okay. Um, and, and that... That that was well, it, it was just unusual, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I I think there is a problem with a connection, right? In those circumstances, uh -huh. you know, it, if you're addressing a jury and you're right in front of the jury box, it's very easy to try at least mm. to engage them yeah. and try and make eye contact with them and find out if they're listening to you or not listening to you or drawing gallows or whatever they might be doing. <laughs> um, I've, I've had that happen to me. <laughs> um, uh, so you, know, you, you can do that. You know, you might not necessarily like the reaction you get, but you get a pretty good feeling as to whether they're even remotely interested in what you're yeah. saying. You, you are literally scanning the entire room as mm -hmm. you're speaking to go from bottom left to top right and everywhere in between. Um, and it, it's, it's, it, I think it's impossible to, to be sure that, you know, that, that well, certainly it's, it's always, I suppose, always impossible to be sure if they're listening to you, but it's more difficult to know just how much attention they're paying. Yeah. Um, you... You know, you can still see the ones who take notes. You can still see the ones who don't take notes. You can still see the ones who sit with their arms folded and the ones who don't sit with their arms folded. Mm. Um, but it, it's just, it, it's a slightly, I don't know, slightly more complex process to make sure that you try and ensure that every one of the jury knows that you are speaking to them. Mm -hmm. um, just because it's, you know, I, I don't know what the size of the court is, but there must be at least, I don't know, 60 feet between each corner, maybe more, yeah. um, as well as all the ones in between. And you, you've just got to try and make sure you don't miss anybody out, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and, and I thought that was a, a little bit unusual. Okay. Um, they, they do, I, I don't know whether they have improved the technology in terms of uh, the audibility, but 
there certainly didn't seem to be any issues with any of the jurors hearing anyone. Right. You know, the, the deputy, myself, or the judge. Or well, if there were any issues, they certainly didn't raise them. Mm-hmm. But uh, in his, uh, when he was addressing the jury in his charge, the judge specifically asked if they could hear him. And everybody, I was watching the ones at the back, and they all said, yeah. So, right. Okay. Um, so that, that I don't know whether that's always been the case or whether that's an improvement. I suppose you don't normally ask the public if they can hear you. No. Um, but, uh, but, but from the comments about the microphones being very sensitive and you being heard in the public gallery when you're chatting, mm-hmm. I think may, maybe they have made some improvements in that way. Sounds um, like that. And that, that is certainly something that you know, we, we'll all have to be aware of, some of us more than others in terms of, you know, speaking to our juniors or speaking to colleagues or solicitors or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, the, m- most of that is going to have to be kept for when the jury are not there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, 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 and, and I suppose, you know, what looking forward, once we get into a situation where there are perhaps more people around the table, so if you're either in a multiple or you've got a senior and junior situation, you might end up with your solicitor or maybe even your junior sitting in the jury box. Yeah. Because I, I, I noticed that some of the seats in the jury box were marked with a tick, i.e. you could sit there. And in fact, one of the jury minders was sitting there right. during most of the trial. And th- there may have to be some arrangement as to how the solicitor or your junior, if they're not seated beside you, mm. how they can communicate with mm-hmm. you. And the, the judges will maybe have to agree or accept that possibly the only way of doing that is text message. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, because, you know, you, you could have a solicitor who's sitting uh, oh, right across the court from you. Yeah. Um, who, who can't, speak to you at all, can't pass you a note. Mm. Um, and, you know, t- text would cover that. It's, it's, this is the situation that it, I think is allowed to occur quite often in the commission yeah. scenario yeah. when your solicitor might be in a totally different room with the accused. Mm-hmm. And so they can text you to say, you know, there's no issues or what about this or whatever. And I, I think that might be something that, is going to have to be considered if a the microphones are as sensitive as they say they are, and b there's a risk that the person instructing you or the person working with you is not going to be close enough for you to speak to them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, I think so. That and that would seem a sensible solution um, to it, to keep social distancing, but allow you for that, and to to you know not that. Um, rise, you know, allowing the court to rise to deal with an issue is um, not an option or shouldn't be used. But if it's a small thing, then surely a text message just to um, yeah. communicate in any small way is the preferable way to do it. Well, I, I, I can see some judges who would have an apoplectic fit at the idea that you were looking at your phone during the trial. But mm-hmm. uh, if it's permitted, then uh, it, it might be the answer to that. Yeah. So, it's certainly going to be a lot. It's going to be a lot more efficient than stopping the trial. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, um, and, and in a sense of going forward, Brian, do you know? Um, obviously, that's the first trials taking place in Edinburgh. The first trial is now taking place in Glasgow. Um, do you know what what is planned for for these two models? Is that is there a choice to be made between them, or is one? Are we, go, are we going to continue with? Um, Two models running for the time being. Well, my my understanding is for the time being, certainly we are continuing with the two models running. I think there's a, another trial due to start tomorrow. Yeah. In Glasgow, with the same setup as uh, as I had, uh, and I, th- I think again similarly, there's another trial in Edinburgh with the same setup as Ian had. Yeah. Um, and so, in the immediate future, I don't know if I, I don't know how many trials they selected in the first tranche and I don't know how many of them are still live options as it were Um, but certainly my understanding is for the immediate future it will be 
the virtual jury in Edinburgh and the socially distant jury in court in Glasgow. Um, yeah. And for how long, I'm not sure. I mean, I, th I think the plan was that there was going to be an evaluation carried out of the different procedures mm -hmm. uh, and presumably either they will settle upon one or the other or something either different or in between. Yeah. I, I mean, the, the, the disadvantage, the obvious disadvantage for both models is they're using up two courts. Yeah. But if the virtual jury model works, i.e. the jury not being in the court, mm -hmm. then that provides much greater flexibility. Because if that works, then it doesn't really matter where your jury are at all. No. If, if you can, if, if there's a line of communication, then you can have the jury wherever. Mm -hmm. And you can have a situation that frees up more courts. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have no idea if this is top secret or not, but my, my understanding is they, they've done a trial involving using a cinema at Fort Kinnaird. Yeah. Uh, and that apparently worked very well. Yeah. And the technology basically, I think, exists that makes that a viable option. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you did something like that, then that would mean you had courts, every court would be free. Yeah. Because you'd have no need to have another court for the jury or indeed for anybody else. You know, the public could presumably sit socially distanced in the public gallery mm -hmm. and the press could sit where they've always sat. Mm -hmm. um, Again, socially distanced or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if the courts have given any thought to the idea that so far as the public aspect of it is concerned, why they can't perhaps stream the trials or something. Don't know. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, th there may be reasons as to why that can't happen. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, it seems a bit, a bit ridiculous that we are either contemplating or have contemplated using a, another court altogether for members of the public and the press because you know th there are very few trials where there is a significant public interest that would could not be dealt with by socially distancing within the, the court. You know, if you can get 15 jurors in, you can get 15 members of the public in, and there's not that many trials where there's more than 15 members of the public. No, that's fair. Um, and, and surely the priority should be getting trials back up and running, utilising as many courtrooms as we possibly can and, and utilising whatever other area, as you say, whether it's cinemas or wherever it's proposed to, to be. Um, you know, so from that, Brian, I mean, is, clearly the Glasgow model is, is different in that there's two courts required. Do you think the preference would be to go with the Edinburgh one if you were, if you were involved in that decision making? I, 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 purely from the practical point of view that you would then free up another court, yeah. then yes. But, you know, wh what I have to say is that the, the model worked, um, you know, and, and in, in no small part due to the judge, Lord Mulholland, to his clerk who dealt with the jury extremely well, I thought, uh, the, the Mesa and his involvement with things, the other court staff, the advocate debut, maybe me, and obviously the jurors themselves. I mean, you know, they they appeared, I don't know whether they were or not, but they appeared to become very comfortable very quickly with the situation they were in. Okay. Now, in some ways, maybe that's easier for them because unless they've been on a jury before, they wouldn't actually know what it was like. I suppose yeah. they've watched on the telly, but um, so it, it maybe didn't seem quite as strange to them as it did to us. But, you know, they... They never, they never seemed to have an issue. Maybe they were an uncomplaining jury, but uh, they, they seemed to deal with it quite well, despite the fact they were sitting in the public gallery. When you did look around, they did all appear to be paying attention. You know, they were listening. Um, and you know, they, they, there was no issues in the course of the trial, and any that there were were really behind the scenes that didn't, didn't, involve me or didn't involve the the accused or indeed the crown. They were more kind of issues between the, 
the jury in their lunch, I think, primarily. Um, but for your part, um, you didn't see any particular diff, or other than the difference of where they're sitting, it didn't seem to affect the trial and the running of the trial as far as from your perspective? No, I, I, you know, it's one of these things where the, the minute it started, you thought, this is really odd. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's kind of a wee bit like watching the football with no fans in it. Um, but w once once you got on your feet to ask your first question, you kind of forgot about it. Yeah. And, you know, you, you knew by that stage you were standing much closer to where the jury are. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you could see them all. And I, I, I think you pretty much forgot about it until mm -hmm. the speech. Yeah. Um, I, I think you pretty much forgot about it. I certainly did. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it, it, it's a relatively small step, I suppose, but mm. it's one where we've had a trial concluded from beginning to end. We've had one in Edinburgh concluded. And it, what, what that has shown is that with the assistance and cooperation of all the various parties that these things can be done yeah and you know we, we spent we as the criminal bar spent a lot of time at the start of this process making the case for why jury trials have to remain mm -hmm. and these two trials have shown that you know it can be done yeah. And it seems to me, if it can be done, it should be done. Yeah. And if there is a way of doing it which will allow more trials to take place, then I think that's probably the route we should be taking. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, let's hope this is just the beginning of, of things getting rolled out. And so there are, are a lot of trials sitting waiting um, to be tried. Um, but... Yeah, hopefully this is the beginning of us, of us getting back to some sort of uh, normality or, or new normality as, as we see it. Yeah, I, I think, I, I, I mean, I, I know that the sort of, the rules for the first tranche of cases were that there was to be no cases involving sexual offences. Yeah. Now, that, that's a rule that is going to have to be... Uh, I don't know, excused or changed or whatever, because, you know, as the statistics keep telling us, that is a large percentage of the cases which go through the high court. Absolutely. And if, if, if you don't include them, then, you know, that, that, that's not going to help the situation. Mm -hmm. But I, I imagine that once it's apparent that these cases can be dealt with, that they can take place, that there's no obvious issues with them any more than there are in trials that take place or took place before lockdown, then presumably they'll all come back on board again and then we can actually start getting through the, the trials that are outstanding. Yeah, let's hope so. M m multiples are, the, are going to be the other problem. Yeah. Um, both in terms of you know, accused socially distancing. Although the, the the one thing that didn't seem to socially distance, as far as I could see, was the accused and the geo Amy staff. Yeah, um, I was going to ask about that. I've seen um, from me here, not not from me, but uh, you know, the fair sentences or or diets were accused of pleading, and the the security literally brushed right past them and sit on either side. So I'm not sure how that falls into the the rules of social distancing from uh, an accused perception, but, uh, perspective, but also from the jury's perspective, if they're being promised social distancing, then surely that should also be taken into account. Yeah, well, I mean, it, you know, up to now, cases that I've seen which involve more than one accused, there didn't seem to be any obvious social distancing either. Yeah. Um, but so, so, you know, that, that might be an issue just simply with the the dock and the size of the dock and the, yeah. the the staff that have to be there, but also obviously just around the table. Mm. It can it can work in some of the bigger courts, but mm. it might not work in every court. Yeah. Um. You know, court, court four in Edinburgh, for example, is you know you're you're never socially distanced from anybody in that court. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, not. But you know, the, the, there are 
so there's plenty of other courts around the country that are big enough to to accommodate a number of accused and a number of counsel. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay. um, whether there might be some interest in moving cases about the country, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Time will tell. Time will tell, indeed. Well, Brian, thank you so much for your time uh, and sharing your experience of that trial. And I'm glad to hear that it's it went smoothly and it, it completed successfully and, and it is a model that can be used going forward. Um, but thank you so much for, for agreeing to speak to us. Um, and I hope to see you soon. OK, not at all. Pleasure. Thank you, Brian. We hope this Hey Legal exclusive content has been of value to you. Follow us please on YouTube and Twitter and create a free account on our website to stay informed and entertained about Scottish legal matters as they happen.